I was a one-man show, a uh, closet warrior, as we say, and Rich gave me the courage to realize that I had a real business. And from there, I was able to go not from just a seven-figure business, but to an eight-figure business within the next two years. I went from making a five-figure income to a seven-figure income. My blog went from 5,000 a month to 15,000 a month and then 20,000 a month. I believe we went from 1.3 million to 2.4 million within a year. We were fairly new in the business of doing internet marketing and we did not know what we did not know. The recession had just hit. I had lost half my business. You know, I just wasn't sure what to do at that point. The best way I could explain it would be if you had a dumpster fire and you would just pour more gas on the dumpster fire, grabbing everything I could because I wanted to make money. But then at the end of the day, it wasn't serving my business. You individually need to do more. That's what I thought. I thought success was based on how hard you work, how many hours you work. Everybody else was just coming up with the tricks and the hacks. Here was this guy who brought not just practical digital online marketing wisdom, but he brought practical business with him. Everybody I knew was like, you need to know Rich. I'm like, Rich, who? I don't know Rich. Who Rich? This is the guru's guru. This dude teaches all the people that we're all reading from. You got to go to the guru to the gurus. This guy is the guru to the gurus. When you get inside kind of the inner circles, everybody knows who Rich is. Rich was the first person who really explained online marketing in a way that I really could understand and apply. It was like the light came on in a dark room and I saw, oh, I've, there's a whole layer to running a business I'd never thought about. Since the time that I started working with them, I've generated, you know, many and many of dollars in revenue. More money started coming in. Then all of a sudden I'm producing products and coaching programs and building an audience that needs what I am good at. And I'm getting 5,000 bucks for my 12 week program. I'm getting 2,000 bucks for my four week program. But I, I want to say this, that it's been about more than just the money. I feel like in many ways he gave me my life back. Besides being a guy who thinks strategically and thinks in terms of solution, Rich is a good guy. And it's really refreshing to have somebody with his caliber of knowledge who you can tell really cares. It was freedom. That's the easiest way I could put it. It was freedom. A sense of freedom, a sense of hope and future where I could see a path to get to where I wanted to go that I wasn't going to get to on my own. Someone like Rich can really put worth in you that you're not seeing. Confidence. You know, in business, so much of our success depends on our own internal confidence. Having the confidence, knowing the fundamentals and, and understanding how the business moves. He works with people who are having your same problem. So he's able to show me someone like me. It's not just someone talking about hypotheticals. These are tried tactics that he's done year in, year out. I'm glad he's back around, you know, helping people. I'm excited that he's coming out of retirement for this. It, that's a big deal. I can certainly recommend it. You no, know, without hesitation, I know that anything that comes out from Rich Shepard is going to be top, top quality. Best coach, best mentor of my life. His main concern is making sure that he's delivering more than he promises in every project that he works on. It had a huge impact on my business, so I'm excited for all the people who will benefit from it this go round. I would just say do it before he goes back into the vault. I think that you will get just some immense value from working with him. Even better than he seems, which is rare on the internet. Hello, 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 hello. Let me one sec. Let me know if you can hear me now. Hello. Yep. Okay. Hello, 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 hello. There we go. Oh, that was. Can you hear me now? You should be able to hear me now. Let me know if you do. Still frozen. I shouldn't be frozen. Slightly. You can slightly hear me. Um, okay. How about now? Hello, 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 hello. Let's let me know. You can hear me. Cool. Awesome. So welcome, everyone. Uh, Rich Sheffern here. I'm wearing a different shirt. Yes, some of you noticed I'm not wearing black. I uh, was at a 
Volume even better now. I can make it even louder, but let me know if this is a good volume. Um, and I can also lower it a little bit. I got this new, um, I guess, amp, for lack of a better word. Uh, I was told that uh, I should get what's called a cloud lifter. And so um, I'm still learning how to use it, obviously, because uh, you guys couldn't hear me at first. But this is what a cloud lifter is. It's just a little box. And the XLR goes in one side, goes out the other side. It's not plugged in, but it does supposedly uh, magnify the volume. So cool. And I'm glad it's working. That makes me happy. And so uh, for those that don't know, my name is Rich Sheffer, and I do these live streams every Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesdays from two to four, Thursdays from six to eight. And, um, and so I do these primarily because uh, we started doing them a year ago, over a year ago, actually, in, um, in the Hamptons when lockdowns first started happening. And uh, did it because one, I was bored and I didn't know it, I didn't have anyone to talk marketing to. And then also recognizing how many more people were spending time online during the lockdowns made me want to actually uh, see it as an opportunity to reintroduce myself to a lot of people online who have gotten online while I have been absent from online, right? Because I retired back in 2012, kind of took five years off, came back in around 2017-18 and uh, launched my relaunched my business inside of Agora, then bought it back out. So um so that's why we're here, and I'm here to help you as much as I possibly can. I've coached a lot of people who you've probably heard of, everyone from Mike Filsane and Ryan Dice and Russell Brunson and Todd Brown, Alex Jeffries, et cetera, and, uh, and many more. And so I kind of have been in this game for about 20 years and therefore have seen a lot of people come and go. I know what tends to work and what... Uh, is more of a short-term game than a long-term game. And so we spoke last week about uh, copywriting and not everything and anything to do with copywriting, but I just wanted to share with you some notes that I had from the very first uh, copywriting seminar I ever went to, which was a Dan Kennedy event. And um, I have since posted the notes, the 24 pages of notes that I took that it's now in the Facebook group. So if you want to get your hands on those notes, just make sure that you're a member of our Facebook group and you will find the notes eagerly awaiting you there. In addition to that, I also posted this weekend a, um, a blog post series that I don't think it's up anymore, but I turned it, it was turned into a PDF by someone on my team a long time ago. And it's all about all the ways that you can build authority, build credibility, and build proof. And so I did a series, I think it was like five or so blog posts, probably about 20 or 30 pages when it's all printed out on uh, how to increase your authority, credibility, notoriety, et cetera. All right. And so that's also waiting for you in the Strategic Profits Facebook group. And the group is growing. So we're really excited about that. Steal Our Winners is growing and we're excited about that. And the team is growing. And we are excited about that. So last um, last week, after going over the copywriting, uh, someone asked me if we could look at flow. And I was hoping that I'd have more time to actually review some of my notes about flow. But I did. Um, I thought I put it in there. Did I? Uh, let's see. Uh, no, I didn't put it in there. Um, the... I did what I did do though is I did put together some of my notes on flow so that we could go over them together. And so that's what we're going to do. If you're just joining me or you've been watching a while, please let me know. Uh, please say hi. Let me know where you're from. Um, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, please put, please smash the subscribe button, thumbs up and comment and share. And if you share, please put hashtag shared. I'd like to thank you personally. If you're watching on Facebook, please comment, emote um, and share as well and put hashtag shared into 
the chat and I will thank you personally. The name of the Facebook group, because Mateo wanted to know it, is Strategic Profits. That's the name of the Facebook group, the name of my company, Strategic Profits. And, um, and so what I thought we would do is go over a bunch of the notes that I have on Flow, and this way we can intelligently talk about it. But before we do that, I want to say hello to everyone, see if there are any questions, and then we can dive into the notes. I also, though, um, the, uh, I also want to make sure that I include one set of notes that for some reason I don't see here. So I just want to make sure that I... Why is it not coming up there? Because I did a, let's see. I did a copywriting training at, where I covered flow as well. There it is. No, uh, let's see. There it is. My presentation on productivity hacks. Okay. So let me just grab this. And we will, I know that it uh, gets a little boring when I do this. So I apologize in advance, but um there we go. I'm going to switch now and focus on you guys. First, though, just post this one. Ah, oh, damn it. That's wrong. Okay. So let's say hello to everyone, and then I will deal with the notes. Also, I think we're going to finally get monetized in Google. So that's uh, monetized in YouTube. So that's exciting. So hello, Renan. Good to see you, my friend, in Brazil and Priya in Israel. Shalom. And glad to be back here today. This talk will be great. I hope so, Renan. And definitely interested in what you guys do to get into flow. Someone's got to say it right off the bat. So I will. Nice non-black t-shirt. Yeah, I went to this um, jiu-jitsu tournament this past weekend. And I went with Michael Masterson, uh, Jack Wade, who works with us at Strategic Profits, and uh, a few of Mark's friends as well. And they had, uh, it was a grappling tournament, a jiu-jitsu tournament, and the they were selling these shirts. I bought one because I liked the tagline, and I thought I could use the tagline for Steal Our Winners with maybe changing one word. So I'll show it to you real quick. The It's Pillage, Plunder, and Rain. And I'm thinking that instead of pillage, plunder, and rain, it could be pillage, plunder, and profit. And that could be a cool tagline for Steal Our Winners. So uh, that's why I'm wearing this shirt today. It was a reminder to me. Uh, I will be back in my gray, not my gray, sorry, my black V-neck shirts uh, on Thursday. Uh, Glad to be back here today. This will be great. Uh, so, yep, okay. Lisa in Miami Beach. Good to see you, Lisa. Renan shared. Thank you so much, Renan. Uh, Mid Razu Ahmed. Hi on Facebook. Uh, no sound. Yeah, there was no sound. Okay. Thank you, Chris. And I see that there's no sound. Uh, yep, we still got sound now. That's really good. Um, but thank you for all of you telling me that there was no sound because I've certainly been guilty of that before. Um, hey, Mika, next week looks perfect for lunch. So let's do lunch next week, Mika. Uh, text me and we'll pick a day. Um, unless you want to join me for one of these live streams and you could always come on Tuesday and we could pick a topic. Uh, hey, Facebook user, you can hear me now. Awesome. You are on. Cool. Uh, yes. Uh, working great. Good. You can hear me now. Cool. Let me know where you guys are watching from. Stephen Finley. Good to go, buddy. Thank you, Stephen. And nice to meet you. I don't know if I've seen you before. And Vivian. Cool. Can hear me now. Greetings from Venezuela. Greetings, Carlos. Good to see you, my friend. And good to see you, Rami, in Mexico. And hopefully I'm not frozen, Gabrielle. Um, cool. You can hear me. Oh, wow. Okay. So lots of you can hear me is cool. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, I know I owe you a call. Um, yes, loud and clear. Perfect. Yes. Hearing you perfect. I can hear you loud and clear, loud and clear. Uh, cool. Not frozen. Volume even better now. Is this the right volume or should I be louder? 
Uh, if anyone wants me louder, let me know. Uh, good. I can hear you. Perfect. Awesome. Good. Loud. Good. Hey, Mark Canty's in the house. Good to see you. Wait, where are the, the, um, okay. Uh, hey, Mark Canty, how you doing? And Bruce and Vivian and Steven and Steven Brownstein and Facebook user and Mika. Cool. Nina. Hello, Rich. Haircut looks great. Have a conference call soon. So only can stay on for a few minutes. I think we should have that transfer done today. If not today, tomorrow, Nina. Um, love my cloud lifter. Too quiet without it. Didn't realize that I needed it. Um, and hopefully now I am, if I was low volume before today, this hopefully makes it better. And Jason in Tampa, always good to see you, Jason. And thank you for coming in. My pleasure. What is your biz model? My biz model is a uh, continuity program called Steal Our Winners, where we deliver each and every month today's top strategies that are currently crushing it online that the rest of the world does not know about, shared by our roster of over a hundred gurus and authorities on marketing and internet marketing. And uh, then from there, uh, we will be relaunching my coaching program soon. That is my overall model. Priya, hey Rich, I sorted the brands into intro with the guarantee line. Now working on the personal, I guess, branding, bio kind of copy. Here's the one I asked help with. Be happy to hear your thoughts. I hope I cracked it. All right. I can't pull up that link while I am live, um, but I can take a screenshot and maybe later I can actually, um, maybe later I can actually uh, go check that out. Let me do that. Okay, cool. I took a screen capture. Uh, Romy, we met at one of Yannick Silver's events many years ago. You were very helpful. Well, glad to hear, Romy. Uh, glad I was helpful. Uh, for those who are brand new here, you're meeting the guy for your business. Well, thank you, Renan. Um, you keep glitching for me. I'm under a big thunderstorm right now, so it might be my service. Yeah, it seems pretty clear here. I don't know if that uh, exactly work what I work on. Okay. Uh, hello, Rich. What's the name of the group? Strategic Profits, Mateo. Uh, greetings from Central Mexico. Good thing, Rami. That's an interesting picture. Can't really make you out there. Um, I am from Jamaica. Good to know, my friend. And Teja, nice to meet you, Teja, Kalen. You must be new as well. I don't recognize you, but welcome. Uh, I'm glad you're covering this flow topic. Thanks. Cool. Uh, hi, Ned, near Washington, D.C., ready to flow, liked and shared. Well, awesome. Thank you, Ned, watching on YouTube. Jesse in Newport Beach, shared. Thank you. Uh, Scotland, Stephen, thank you. Nice to see you. Uh, Raquel, drawn blood in the blood lab uh, in Cali. Good to see you, Raquel. Uh, the introvert went out in public. Yes, they did. Tay, how do you know that I'm an introvert? And uh, interesting. Have we ever spoken? I don't know. Um, good color on you, Rich. Well, thank you. I think it matches my eyes a little bit since I have hazel eyes. Makes me look younger. Well, I'm trying. I'm desperately trying. This 50-year-old is trying to pretend he's not. Um, nice to hear your voice. Always interested in flow, as you know, as we most are, aren't we? Uh, Tony from the UK, glad you're back in the field. Uh, Jose from New York. Cool. Uh, great three Ps. What's about your female audience? Yeah, I know, Pat. We've gone back and forth on this. Like, do we try and kind of tone it down, make it more feminine friendly? Or do we go all in and embrace like the idea of um, controls, winners, taking them, right? Um, I'd say based on the fact that I'm wearing this shirt and thinking about it, we're moving closer and closer to just fully embracing it. 
Um, so there's that. Jeff in Canada. Good to see you, Jeff. And Michael Lassen, who has a new kid. Congrats, Michael. That's number four, right? And uh, <laughs> yep. Tellman Knutson in the house. Yo, Tellman. Always good to see you. Uh, Jeffrey from St. Paul. Ah, St. Paul Press. Very cool. That's one of the divisions I work with in Agora. And Romy says thanks. And good day from Australia. Good day to you, Leanne. And New Jersey, how are you? I'm good. How are you, New Jersey? Uh, volume is fine. Cool. Uh, what's up? Anthony from Cali. Good to see you, Anthony. Uh, sunny in Southern California, Huntington Beach. Peter, let's go, buddy. Enough chit chat. Yep, I agree. Anyone have a look to the flow we were talking about? Um, very happy with the Steel Our Winners content. Thank you, Vance. Hey, Rich, what's your top best question to ask during journaling? Uh, what is it I'm pretending not to notice? Perfect. I will reward you with an introduction to one. If the best herbalist around with the highest quality stuff, you will like him. What are we talking about there? Not sure. Uh, Andres. Hey there, Rich. It's weird to see you not wearing a black t-shirt. At some point you talked about making compressed short form summary videos from these lives. Is that still something you plan on doing? Yes, it is. In fact, I just interviewed a, uh, a gentleman by the name of CJ, he might be my new assistant and he has um, lots of video editing ability. So that is cool to think about. And we're going to do a little trial run. So we'll see how that goes. Charlotte is in Greece as always. Good to see you, Charlotte. No, we haven't. So then how do you know I'm an introvert? Um, are you launching BGS coaching? Launching BGS like coaching program. Yes, I am, but just updated from Orlando. Good to see you, Joshua. Renan, I tend to procrastinate and push things to the limit, to the deadline. Then I have to get super focused and get the job done. It's a daily struggle against myself. Does this happen to you guys as well? It happens to me, Renan. And so I put myself in those positions, right? And I try to do that even when there's not a deadline. And I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, we're going to be talking about flow, strategies to get into it. And so why does 50 years seem young to my 87 in here in San Diego? Because it is, I guess, in comparison, right? Um, not just a might less pillage and plunder, LOL. Uh, live with Rich. Thanks, John. Hi, friend. Uh, there are other ways of sounding and feeling powerful. Yep. Hey, what's up, buddy? What's up to you? Although I don't know who that is. And hello from Georgia, Rebecca, Amanda. You have two first names. All right, so that's that, right? It's like, so now we can actually get into it. And um, let's see, one last thing here from Nina. Whoops. What is it I'm pretending not to notice? Awesome question. I do ostrich all the time, taking off, but we'll check this out later on YouTube. Cool. All right, so um, let's see what would be the best way for me to actually show you my screen and we can kind of go through this together. And so uh, let's see, I'm going to share screen. And I want to share this screen, but maybe I can share a window. Well, let me see this, share this. Cool. All right. So the first one that I want to find now, so I, I created this as you can see, but I will make this bigger in a second. I just want to put one of the ones that I did not put in here, here. So let's just find it. And it's, oh, it's, I know where it is. It's in my notes and outline. So I can just actually do it from here. It's really strange guys, because I am, uh, Uh, let me just do a search. It's probably going to be the easiest. Uh, my presentation. Uh, my presentation. There we go. Cool. All right. So let's start with this. Um, we're going to talk about flow, but I find that um, this actually is critical to being in flow. And so let's see if we can make this a little bit bigger. Yeah, there we go. And then let's see if we can actually, can we do this? Yeah. 
Cool. All right. So a while back, and I think like this is a good place to start. You guys tell me. Um, and as you can see, like this is linked to another presentation, not a presentation, but yeah, other set of notes, how I learn. So we'll, we can revisit that and then we'll go into some flow notes as well. I've attended seminars on flow. I've read tons of books on flow. So I definitely have a bunch to share. Um, all right. So, um, let's go. All right. So my motivation strategy, like it's important to, we'll get into the details of flow, right? Like the four requirements and those things. And that I'll see in my notes on flow. I know that there are these elements and we'll get into what they are, but certainly one of them is being motivated, right? And it's important that as an entrepreneur, right? Or as someone that works for themselves, that you're very clear about what maximizes your motivation. This is what maximizes my motivation, right? So when I am procrastinating or when I'm thinking about a project, I try to make sure that my projects that I'm going to work on like fulfill as many of these as possible because I know that when a project is a big opportunity, right? Like that's the first one. I'm more prone to take it more seriously and be more engaged in it. Is there an external real deadlines? Deadlines drive action that doesn't only work for prospects and customers, that works on ourselves, right? Am I motivated? Is it right for me, right? And are the stakes high, right? So I was talking to uh, CJ, this gentleman that I was interviewing for an assistant, and um, he had uh, recently within the last year or so, hurt his shoulder with a motorcycle accident. And he was saying how much he enjoys, he enjoyed riding his motorcycle because it's that kind of like on the cusp of danger and excitement, right? And the only thing that I have that I've certainly been in dangerous situations in my life, but the one that I felt most alive in was when Kim bought me a sparring session with a UFC fighter and the UFC fighter was probably going at about 5%. He probably could have killed me in about 10 seconds if he wanted to. But he was playing with me because, like, we had paid for a sparring session. And uh, I never felt more alive. You, you know, like, I never felt more in the present moment than uh, in that sparring session with that fighter. And I, like, the feeling was so amazing, so present. Um, but I don't want to get hit in the head. So um, it's not something I've ever done after that one session, but I really did enjoy it. And, um, and I find that the higher the stakes, generally, the easier it is for me to focus. Okay, would I be letting people down, especially people that are important to me? That seems to be like extremely critical. If I can tie it into, um, if I could tie it into any project into a, re a deliverable for a specific person that I don't, that I respect, that I admire, that I don't want to disappoint, um, those things help me get maximally motivated, right? So what is it for you? Because if you know what motivates you, like what characteristics of projects does a project need to have in order to get the maximum out of you, then you can engineer it into your projects, right? Now that I know that this is my motivation strategy, I can actually ensure that I'm looking at projects from this perspective. Let me know if that makes sense. It should make sense to you, um, but I just want to make sure that you're following my logic here. And hopefully, you are cool. So let's continue. Whoa. Okay. Well, all right. So next is sleep, right? And while this does not have to do that much with flow, we're going to, there is a little section on flow. So I'm going to get to that part, but you know, I've been fixated on sleep recently and really doing my best to maximize the amount of deep sleep I get as early as possible. And I'm curious, like for any of you, if any of you use an aura ring or anything like that, I use an aura ring, I use my Apple watch, right? Um, I'm curious how much deep sleep you get. Because like for me, I would say I get 
if I'm lucky, like lucky, an hour and a half, right? Like generally, I'm good for about an hour's worth of deep sleep. And I think it should be more than that. And I'm working hard to try and get there. So routine is everything. Getting up and going to bed at the same time every day, like is golden. And obviously, uh, the well, not obviously, but the hours before midnight are a lot more beneficial often than the hours after or 10 to 2, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. are like the critical sleep hours. I know that's where I get most of my deep sleep. And um, the reason I know that is because the aura ring tells me uh, how much deep sleep I'm getting. Now, anytime I drink alcohol, I see immediately that it, it messes up my deep sleep. So I generally don't drink alcohol that frequently. I, wear, I use a chili pad. That's probably been the number one thing that has made the biggest difference in my sleep. A chili pad sits under your mattress. Mm. Sorry, sits above your mattress, between your mattress and your sheet. It has water tubes going through it, and you can set the temperature for any temperature you want. So I generally sleep on a mattress that is 50 degrees, um, very cold, uh, because I sleep hot, whereas Kim sleeps with it like set for 90 some odd degrees. Blue light blocking glasses, right? So I've always had blue blocks, which were these like red glasses that to me seemed like I was coming from a science fiction movie. I just bought a whole bunch of blue light glasses um, that are more just general like this one. Um, and what's cool is it actually came with, and this comes back to marketing, it came with a demonstration device where this is a blue light, I don't know if you can see it, but this blue light, um, when exposed to this um, white sheet here, it will turn it red, like, or purple. I don't know if you can see it, but if you can, it's purple now. And um, let's see. Uh, here we go. Um, and then when I put like these glasses in between and I shine it, it doesn't turn purple. But if I take a pair of readers and shine it through, it does turn purple. So these actually work. And I bought a bunch of these just so that I really can make sure that after 8 p.m. I'm wearing this. And actually, uh, I had a meeting last night with Jay Abraham and I was wearing them. Uh, and he's like, I didn't know you wear glasses. And I was like, only at night. And green light to wake up, I wear these glasses that shoot green light into my eyes for 20 minutes in the morning, and I always try to go to bed on an empty stomach. I sleep so much better. Okay, flow. And then we'll get into my real notes. Um, racing towards adrenaline. So um, I have ADD. I haven't made that any kind of mystery whatsoever. And so oftentimes, it's that adrenaline of racing towards adrenaline deadline that really amps me up, right? That really gets me going. That really like I perform at my best. It's like I can work for three days on a presentation and the last hour before I actually have to give it, I'm making a lot of the decisions that for whatever reason I didn't make throughout where I'm editing, taking things out, like connecting things. It's all in that last hour. And so my goal is right to be able to work that way more frequently, right? Not just on deadline. So oftentimes what I'll do is I will race a timer, right? Like, so I will give myself a certain amount of time to work on something and I will like stick to that. <laughs> That's one thing I'll do. Um, another thing is the next bullet point here where I will work side by side with someone that I respect or admire because it, I don't want the, them to see me kind of messing around, right? I want them I want them to continue to respect me, right? So therefore, working side by side or in the same room, stuff like that, filling my brain with info and then the epiphany release. So a lot of times I will uh, constantly be like filling my brain with relevant information on a project. And then from there, um, I will let it all sit and sometimes I'll go get stoned. Sometimes I'll just relax, but it's the relaxation after I've filled my brain with stuff where all of a sudden good ideas start popping out. 
Uh, I listened to Brain FM. I was like a charter member of Brain FM, and Brain FM plays um, different uh, music with different binaural beats uh, embedded in the music. It's an it's a iPhone app that uh, and a computer app that um, I've been using for a long time. And David Guetta is uh, a DJ that mixes techno that I like. Right. So those are some of the things with flow. We'll get into more in a moment. But one of the things that in this conversation that I am pulling from these notes uh, was recognize that I was sharing with copywriters was recognizing that you are a choice architect, that you can design your life so that the choices, some of the choices that would steer you in the wrong direction are no longer even there, right? So you, uh, I don't make the mistake of thinking that the rich Sheffron of tomorrow is going to be any better than today, right? And I don't mean that in like a way like we're constantly trying to get better. Of course we are, right? But like if I am more prone to make a bad decision, right? On a, I want to try and avoid that, right? So for example, um, Evaldo, who is one of the top copywriters at Agora, he uh, will, he writes, I don't remember upstairs or downstairs, but he'll leave his phone. Uh, if he's right, if he writes downstairs, I think he leaves his phone upstairs. That forces him, it, when and if he wants to check his phone, he has to get up from his desk, go upstairs, and he's less likely to do it, right? I know people who have taken the batteries out of their remote control for their TV, take the batteries, put it in the kitchen. So this way, if they want to sit down and watch television, they then first have to go into the kitchen, get the batteries, put the batteries into the remote. Now, that might seem kind of silly, but what you're trying to do is increase the friction to take the wrong path, right? Um, so the anywhere where you can pre-think, where you can avoid temptation where you can structure yourself right so that you're most motivated to take the right action as opposed to the wrong action is really powerful and i find that most people don't do that like they give their future self too much credit they think their future self for some reason is going to be spot on in their decision making even though that future self might be tomorrow's self and today they're really struggling right? It doesn't work that way. What has to happen is, is that you have to recognize that you can consciously like outfox, outthink the mistakes that you default to make. So, you know, um, hopefully that's clear. Uh, and I think it is, it should be pretty clear, right? Let's see. Yep. Cell phone. Uh, work where there's no Wi-Fi, right? A lot of times I'll take my laptop, I'll go somewhere. I only have two hours until the battery uh, dies. And so I'm racing to finish my work before the battery dies, uh, right? Like, um, right, like set up rules. Like if you tend to avoid writing your daily email that you're going to send out, maybe you make up a rule that you're not going to take a shower until after you've written it, right? So there's this like, pressure to get it done so you can shower. Um, right. So I generally wear the same outfit all the time. And I do that because it's just another thing that like causes friction. Right. We've talked about, let me check back in with you guys for a minute and then we'll get to my more, um, specific notes. Let's just kind of look at what I listed here. These are all the different things that I use. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. So let's, um, I'll leave this here for a second, but I, I, just to reaffirm this before I go back to your comments and questions that 
if you recognize the areas in your life where you take the path of least resistance, the goal is, is to make the right choice, the path of least resistance, as opposed to the wrong choice, right? Make it so that it's easiest to make the decision that you know will bring you forward the most. Okay. So let's go back to me for a second and let's see here. All right. We'll go back to me. Cool. And now, um, let's see here. Um, all right. Let's see. Oh, Denise. Hello, Denise. Would love to see a video of that fight. Yeah, I think I have some videos, actually. Uh, perfect till now, my friend, as usual. Uh, how do you know if you're in deep sleep? You can't tell just by knowing, right? You generally have to have some kind of tracking device on you. I go to bed at the same time, then my dog uh, wakes me up, LOL. Yeah. Um, what's crazy is I, I, Sean Stevenson, who's a sleep expert, nutritionist kind of guy, he talks about this one study where any light in your bedroom can affect your deep sleep, even if it doesn't hit your eyes, that shining a bright light like on your in the back of your knee can disrupt your sleep because you have photosensors on your skin. Um, and that's how precious, right? Deep sleep can be and how and why it can be difficult, right? Why is everything so blurry? I don't know. Hey, Paul Hoffman, uh, the uh, creator of the jingle. Have you driven a Ford lately? Paul, if you, if that, if you ever get tired of me saying that, let me know. Um, <laughs> but that's Paul Hoffman who sends me a text every morning to motivate me. Why is everything so blurry now? Pat, nothing should be blurry except the background, but let me know. Yes, everything is blurry. Uh-oh. Is there a link to the document to fill? Was the document blurry? Oh, damn. Uh, hello, Rich from Hong Kong. Ah, be safe in Hong Kong. Wow. Uh, Hanina. Oh, all right. Uh, what up? Love you. Love you too, Paul. Not blurry. Cool. All right. Jeez, um, I'm like learning, like this mouse that I'm using is works the other way. Uh, no clear. Cool. All right. So you guys with me so far? And uh, what do you guys think about this idea that you're probably going to take the path of least resistance? So by understanding that, building that into your routine so that the path of least resistance is the right path. For me, most of the time I'm procrastinating, it's something really unlogical. I know I have to get stuff done, but my brain tricks me to procrastinate till the very last minute. That's how a lot of people are, Renan. Meditate an hour a day, even 20 minutes, and you will sleep as deep as it gets. A short method I used and sleep like a mummy for years. I do meditate, but maybe I don't meditate long enough. Great info, info so far, Rich. Excited to see more. Okay, so then let's dive back in. Um, so yeah, let's dive back in. So chunking information, absorbing it, then letting it sit there for a day. Chilling is what helps you. Um, on the, it's like filling my brain with so much that there's frustration, then somehow unplugging sometimes by just chilling, sometimes by getting stoned or something and going and working out, but something that allows my brain then to totally relax so that the ideas can start to percolate. It was the document that became blurry. That doesn't really make sense, but okay, too true, but I make excuses and go out of my way not to do the things I need to. It's common. Okay, so let's now go back here and um, hopefully it's not still blurry, um, but there you go. Okay, so we're going to now close, make this note smaller and let's see. Um, nope, that's not what I want. And all right, let's see. We, I think we have to do this. We have to escape on this or let's do this. Boom, boom. There we go. And now we can, uh, all notes. Cool. 
All right. So now let's uh, want to see which one is the best one. Book notes flow. There was a okay. Writing and flow. Should we go to that one first? Let's go to writing and flow. Oh, I don't want to go to an external thing. What the hell is that? Hold on. Writing and flow. Did I use external? Oh, this is unfortunate. Okay, guys, hold on. Why would it be taking me to a page like this? This doesn't really make a lot of sense. I want to see how it looks on the web. If it works, if it looks halfway decent or better, then I'll go there. But if not, I don't know why this would be there like that. Maybe because. Yeah, okay, this is going to open all inside, so that's not going to work. All right. The joy, the joy, right? All right, so then let's just go here. That's a bummer. Flow. And let's do this. All right. So these are notes that I'm working on, not finished, right? It's writing and flow. That's the name of the book. There you can see the headline, right? Or the title. And haven't gotten this far, right? So as you know, when I am... Oh, this is going to now... Hold on. All right. I'm going to do that. And what I want to do is this. Guys, sorry. I don't know why I'm having so many problems pulling up these notes. This should not be this way. I don't know why this is working this way. Um, all right. All right. So should we look at writing or do you think it would be better to look at flow? You know what? Let me, before I do this, actually, sorry, guys. I want to show you a different, um, I want to show you a different one. Be and the reason I want to show you a different one is that um, I think it's probably better to start with the general and then work our way to the specific, I think. So um, I want to, I, I know I have this cool diagram and I think that that would be probably good to look at first. Yes. Okay. So here we go. Let's look at this diagram. And all right. Oh, that should be bigger. Let's do this. Okay. To access flow, a person must concentrate attention on the task at hand and moment, momentarily forget everything else, right? And it's that forgetting everything else that's critical. And that's why many people tend to thrive when they are worried about missing a deadline, because it's really easy to forget about everything else when you're racing towards a deadline, right? So flow producing activities require an initial investment of attention before they begin to become enjoyable. Can you guys read that? Like, is that relatively easy to read? I can certainly make it bigger, I think. Um, and I can actually also just remove myself here for a second. So let's do that. Whoa, that's not what I wanted. I don't know why this happens, but okay. And now let's just go like that. Um, there we go. All right. Enter flow at work by starting each task with a focus exercise to cultivate single pointed attention. Close your eyes, pay attention to music or your breathing for a minute. When you open your eyes, direct that focus, uh, at, on the task at hand, right? All right here. Can you guys read this? Um, let me know. Think of your focus exercise like a warm-up routine before a workout. The purpose is to make the transition from scattered to focus to single focus. 
uh, smoother. Flow producing activities require an initial investment of attention before they begin to be enjoyable, right? So that's critical from the standpoint that you have to recognize that you're not just going to drop into flow, right? Like that generally doesn't happen. You have to first, um, oh, whoops, you have to first um, direct some attention towards the actual task at hand. And it's only through that task that you can actually start to build some momentum. So you're going to need some amount of time, right, to get into that state. But let's keep it going. Okay. So uh, in flow, there is no room for self scrutiny, right? You begin to stop thinking about yourself. You're, cons you're, you're no longer afraid of failure. You're no longer concerned about imposter syndrome. You are in the zone, you are completely focused on the task at hand. And when you're completely focused on the task at hand, you lose that sense of self, right? You, that, you know, you become kind of unaware of what's going on around you and in you, if that makes sense. A rock climber, uh, Chickle, McKelly, uh interview said, you can get your ego mixed up with climbing in all sorts of ways, but when things become automatic, it's like an egoless thing. Somehow the right thing is done without you ever thinking about it. And I would imagine that most of us have had that experience, right? Like when you get into that zone where there is a clear outcome, right? The outcome is clear. You're motivated, right? You're focused. Um, what you can often accomplish can even like surprise yourself, right? A lot of times, like at least with my brain, the ADD type brain, um, stimulants, right? Whether it's coffee, whether it's monster, right? Which all stops by generally 2 p.m. Uh, so that I sleep well. But um, these all are that excitatory state that I can put into what it is I'm working on. Okay. Feedback. Feedback is critical when it comes to flow, right? You need a way of monitoring your activity and whether or not it's working. So in this example, the climber inching up a vertical wall of rock has a very simple goal in mind to complete the climb without falling. Every second, hour after hour, he receives information that he is meeting the basic goal. Chess players in flow have the clear objective to mate the opponent's king uh, before their king is mated. With each move, he can calculate whether he has come closer to this objective. To determine if your actions at work are moving closer to your objective, you must give yourself feedback throughout the day. Now, how do you judge your performance? If you have no way of judging your performance, it's very difficult then. You're actually hindering flow because you have no way of knowing or rewarding or being happy for yourself when you accomplish stuff. This is one of the reasons why I generally script my day in the morning. In order for today to be a great day, what has to occur? And I don't make it so that like it's so high that I never hit it. I make it so that if I can spend a few hours of focused attention, I'm going to get it done. And then when my head hits the pillow at night, I can feel good about what I did. And that only happens because I took the time in the morning to define what the win would be. Because oftentimes I'm an asshole to myself where if I don't define what the win is, right, in the morning, I will change the rules at the end of the day. So in the morning, if I just say to myself, I want to make sure that I, you know, get a bunch of uh, calls scheduled for Steal Our Winners, um, I might schedule like four or five calls while doing a bunch of other stuff. And then at the end of the day, I'll be like, you know, I really didn't get anything done today of any consequence. And then I'll be thinking about it. I'll be like, wait a second. I did do this and I did do that. And so I don't like to do that to myself. I want to make sure that I am motiv I'm a motivating force in my life, not a demotivating force in my own life. And so I do that, right, um, to really kind of define the day um, as far as what a win is. Um, I do this by setting an hour alarm. When the alarm goes off, I ask myself, what did I accomplish in the last hour? What can I accomplish in the next hour? I do have my watch goes off every hour, just a ding, and to let me know, like, 
to look at the clock, recognize what I'm doing, where I'm at in my day. Four challenge, right? So these are the four areas that uh, insights from the book flow uh, from some uh, thing I downloaded. And so we have focus, freedom, feedback, and challenge, right? And challenge. The challenge needs to be just right, right? Too much of a challenge causes anxiety. Too little of a challenge causes boredom. We're looking for that sweet spot. And that often um, comes down to like how you chunk activities. So if you're playing chess, you should play chess against players who are rated just 4% better than you. If you are play against a weaker player, you'll win too easily and be bored. If you play against a grandmaster, you'll consistently be crushed and find the experience frustrating and hopeless. But if you can compete against people that are slightly better in any area, right, you will get better and you know you can win if you dig deep, dedicate your attention to the task at hand and experience flow. If you adjust the difficulty of work tasks to be slightly harder than what you can do comfortably, you can also find flow, right? So take something that's too easy for you, figure out a way to make it a little bit more of a challenge, either racing a clock or something to that effect, where you're making the task harder. And by making the task harder, you find oftentimes that it's easier to get into flow because now there's like, there is a challenge, right? So if you adjust the difficulty of word tasks to be slightly harder than what you can do comfortably, you might find flow. If you can comfortably write a thousand words in 25 minutes, push yourself to do a thousand words in 24 minutes or 23 minutes or 22 minutes, right? Or if you can clean the kitchen in 20 minutes, uh, try to do it in 15 minutes or, you know, some challenge, right? You know, if your challenge is in the 4% zone, if half the time you meet your expectations and half the time you don't. Most enjoyable activities are not natural. They demand an effort that initially one is reluctant to make. But once the interaction starts to provide feedback to the person's skills, it usually begins to be intrinsically rewarding. So now before we go to the next note, there's a couple things that I want to explain to you. So the first thing that I do want to explain to each and every one of you is that the... I came, I came to a realization about myself. I think it's a realization that many people could probably come to about themselves, right? So I made a rule with myself like 20 years ago that I would get on the elliptical every day and I would work out for at least five minutes. 99% of the days I do an hour or a half hour, right? I almost never do five minutes, but sometimes I get on and after a couple minutes, I'm like, I'm just not feeling it and I get off, right? But here's the thing, right? Like, so I did that for like, I've done that for like 20 years. I never applied it to any other area of my life. I was doing a Steal Our Winners uh, segment with Katrina Ruth in Australia. And she's extremely prolific. And she said something to me that really registered. And she said, you know, I never feel like writing when I'm not writing. When I start writing, then oftentimes I feel like writing. Okay. And that's pretty much my experience with the elliptical, right? That I never, unless like I'm trying to escape something, I generally am not like, anxious and excited to get on the elliptical. But once I'm on for a few minutes, I start feeling better. And then I generally stay the whole time. So the distinction from this that I took away from it is that I can't make a decision about whether I feel like doing something when I'm not doing it, right? Because I don't know what it will feel like when I'm doing it. The only way that I can decide that I don't want to do something is if I'm doing it right? Because there's always going to be friction and there's always going to be that initial momentum that needs to be created. And so, of course, like, you know, there's resistance to get going, right? But if I recognize that me not feeling like doing something is not legitimate until I'm actually doing it, then it helps me make better decisions. So it means that like if I'm procrastinating writing, the only way I can make a decision not to write is to start writing, right? If I am uh, procrastinating working out, 
The only way I can make a decision about whether I'm going to work out or not is to start working out. So in other words, I cannot decide not to do something unless I partake, right? Like, and you know, within, within the bounds of rationality, right? But that is something really interesting to think about. I can't really decide whether I feel like doing something when I'm not doing it, right? Most things I don't feel like doing until I do it. And that even includes like leaving the house or anything else. So, so that's one rule that I have for myself that I cannot make a decision about what I feel like doing unless I'm doing it. And then I'm very clear that if I'm doing it and I don't feel like doing it, that's legitimate, right? The next is, and this is a quote, there's two quotes, right? That right now at least stick in my head. Uh, one is by Wayne Dyer. And I don't know why this I feel the need to share right now because it's not necessarily related. But uh, Wayne Dyer said something that I always stuck with me. And he said, no amount of self-help will ever lead to self-acceptance, right? No matter how much you work on yourself, you're never going to get to a place where you feel like you're good enough. So if you recognize that, you got to work on feeling good enough regardless of self-help, right? Like, because just improving yourself will never cause that feeling of satiation. That's a, like about yourself. That's a totally different thing to get to. And it doesn't get you don't get to it by just improving yourself, right? And then the other is about perfectionism, which oftentimes goes hand in hand with procrastination. And both of these, procrastination and perfectionism, totally destroy flow. But per this was a quote that I read in a book on perfectionism. I wish I could give credit to the author. Uh, I don't remember the book, but uh, it said that perfectionism is trying to get the world to believe something about yourself that you don't believe about yourself. So I'll say that again. Perfectionism is trying to get the world to believe something about yourself that you don't believe about yourself. And as someone who has struggled with perfectionism, I find that true. Like it was important for me, and I still struggle with it at times, for people to know or think that I'm smart. Right. So that's only important. When you don't think you're smart. Right. It only becomes something when you're trying to prove something that you don't believe that I don't feel the need to prove to you that I'm Rich Sheffron. That's my name. Right. I don't spend any time proving I'm Rich Sheffron. Um, so it's not something that will ever be an issue for me. However, right? When you are trying to have people think about you in a way that you don't think about yourself that way, then what you're defaulting to is you're using what you're working on as kind of the currency to buy that, right? That to get others to believe that about you, even though you don't believe about that about you. And that, to me, when I read that quote, that like hit me with like a ton of bricks, because for me, I found that to be highly accurate and that was pointing me to the work I had to do. So hopefully that's helpful. Let's now take a look at some more note, actual notes on flow. And then what we'll do is kind of what we've done, uh, what we've done in the past where I will uh, make these notes a lot better and for Thursday, and then we'll start to really toggle everything together. And I'm just now doing that. Cool. All right. And now let's see. Just looking for one that, uh, all right. Yeah, let's do this one. And Finding Flow. That's the book we're going to pull up. And while it's pulling that up, I'm just going to get rid of that. All right. And then here. And now here. So if I'm looking at this, this is Finding Flow. This is a book. All right. That's my book notes. All right. And so we're going to go through these together. All right. And hopefully that's cool. Let's just check in with you guys real quick, if that's OK. Um, all right. OK, it's a bit tiny. 
Okay. Well, uh, off the subject, what is the layout of your Apple's desktop? It looks like it manages a lot of info quite visually. Uh, I'm not sure what you saw, but yeah, I do. And this is, you know, I'm using two different computers right now. Um, also, if you ever put together a one day person in seminar in Delray, I'm in the travel from West Palm Beach would be a breeze. Good to know, Jamie. Um, Ecamm wonders. Yes. And StreamYard, the two combined. No. Yes. Can read viewable, certainly readable. Cool. Writing is a reflection of thinking. Clarity is not easy. It takes effort. That's why writing is work. What do you think? Yeah. Writing is certainly work. Uh, curious. What, why do you script your day in the morning versus night before I reflect on the day, the night of, right. And I think about what I want to accomplish the next day, but I also let how I'm feeling and my, in that morning period of time, when I first get up and I'm writing in my journal, that's when I'm kind of thinking about the day and actually planning it. Uh, in my opinion, clarity in reading and writing is supreme. That's one of the reasons why I admire the written work of Peter F. Drucker. I love Drucker. So I agree. Uh, hi, Rajesh. Good to see you. And Lewis, sometimes before doing deep work, I do something with perceived risk and it helps me get into a flow a lot easier. That's really interesting, Lewis. Do you have an example? Because that I find relatively fascinating. So I like that. I'd love to uh, know more. Oh, by the way, guys, I bought, um, this is a total aside, ADD moment here, but I bought, so this guy, Sean Stevenson, this sleep expert who seems like the real deal. And I, he seems as if someone like that I could, uh, that I believe, right? Because sometimes I, there's, I'm a kind of a skeptical person. And uh, he's the second person that told me about grounding which to me seems like the biggest crock, right? That's about getting your feet like on natural ground or that you can use grounding mats, right? So they're plugged into that middle plug, right? That keeps your outlets grounded and to a mat or to a sheet. And supposedly for some reason, it helps like uh, keep the electrical charge of the body or something. I don't even really know. I haven't done the research. I downloaded some stuff. I haven't read it yet. Um, but, uh, Sean Stevenson was talking about, and I was like, you know, he's like the third person. Cause also a friend of mine told me that it's something I should look at. And it just sounded like pseudoscience to me, but, um, I'm going to give it a, a whirl. I ordered some stuff on Amazon and I will let you guys know about it. I'm reminded of that because right now I'm standing with my legs spread out so that I can be in this camera shot as opposed to sitting. But, um, I will be getting a grounding mat soon. And when I get that grounding mat, then I will be fully charged as I am talking to you. All right. So um, let's now see who is next here. Uh, Rajesh, good to see you again. Good to see you, my friend. Josh said, awesome. Cool. Is spontaneous sacrificed as a result? No, because like when I think about like a win for the day, uh, I make it so that it's something that I can hit. I'm not trying to be Superman when I come up with that win, like what's going to be the win. I'm trying to make it easy for myself. Something that, yes, is valuable, is important, advances the business, right? But is also something that I can get done during that day so that like I am racing. If I don't see an end in sight, there's no reason to race, right? I need to see an end, which means I need to break stuff up so that I can get that win. If I can't get that win, I'm less motivated. Um, all right. So sorry, Rich, for being late. Why do people apologize for being late? You can come and go as you please, my friend, and I'm just happy that you're here. Uh, you cannot make the distinction about whether you feel like doing something or not unless you're doing the thing. Yeah, that's what I think. Uh, wow, that's good. How can you know if you wanna do something if you're not doing it to find out? Yeah, you're just perceiving it. And since, right, Objects in motion tend to stay in motion. Objects not in motion tend not to. And therefore, if you're not in motion, of course, you're not going to feel like getting into motion. And that's the whole point. Uh, awesome video. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it and appreciate the comment. Uh, Rich, can you help? Please repeat the quote on no matter how much self-help you get, you'll never be enough. Uh, no amount of self-help or self-development leads to self-acceptance. No amount of self-development, self-acceptance, self-work, right? Work leads to self-acceptance. You never get to a point where you're like, now I am good. Uh, like, you know, 
that just doesn't happen. And so you have to, you don't get it from there. You get it somewhere else. And then the perfection quote is, perfectionism is trying to get the world to believe something about yourself that you don't believe about yourself. That's the quote. Uh, good point about perfection, make believe to create the reality, very hypnotic. Uh, Rich, check out William Glasser. I've read William Glasser. Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, cannot see notes. That's because right now I don't have them on. Thank you for the transparency and sharing your insight. Cool, cool, cool. Keep going. Cool. Grounding definitely works. I've done it for years. Interesting. When you say it works, what does that mean, Kevin, Richard? Like, how do you know it's working? Like, what do you feel different? Rich, do you recommend the flow book by uh, my Kahali? Yes, I do. I think it's a great book. We're going to get there. Uh, there is a document, documentary on Gaia. Is Gaia, oh, Gaia is like the world, like Mother Earth. Does that translate into earthing? Uh, I slept on a magnet mattress for years. I don't know if a magnet is the same thing, is it? Um, just pulled flow uh, off my library shelf. Time to reread. Very cool. Uh, hey, Rich, do you do these videos at a set times? I'd like to make sure I catch them every time. Yeah, I do them on Tuesdays from 2 to 4 Eastern and Thursdays from 6 to 8 Eastern. Uh, whatever you can do or dream, you can begin it. Boldness has genius power and magic in it. True that. Uh, good to be grounded. Uh, barefoot outside is helps. Yeah. That's what they say. Any thoughts on using Promodoro time blocks to focus and help get in the flow? Yeah, totally rod. So I love Promodoros for the same reason that I'm racing like a clock. I find that like there are certain things like using a mind map to organize my thoughts, to use a timer, to either race or do a Promodoro. Um, these things are essential for me to get the best out of my work. Um, go. I suffer from inflammation. Well, if you suffer from inflammation, oh, that's why you use grounding. Got it. All right. For earthing. Uh, called earthing. Yeah. Rich, can you get us more from Dave Miz for email marketing? It seems there's a lot of noise out there when it comes to making email work. Um, well, there was the one from Fernando, which is how to have like a list of a million with a 50% open rate. That's in uh, Steal Our Winners. And I'm talking to someone who everyone has mentioned as it relates to um, email. Uh, supposedly someone who's extremely knowledgeable. I'll tell you who it is. Oop. Okay. Whoa. There we go. Um, I am talking to... Um, where is this guy? I thought I was talking to him on uh, Thursday. Troy Erickson. Uh, so Troy Erickson's name keeps being thrown around as someone I need to talk to about email. And so I will be talking to him uh, on Thursday. It shows the science with monitors and stuff. Cool. Uh, don't agree on perfection. Perfection is driven by the need to reach ideal conditions. No, not if you're a perfectionist, because perfection's not possible. Uh, but for me, I feel less pain and I'm able to walk and stretch easier. Good to know. Uh, you can feel into doing tasks to get flow. If you have a strong memory or recollection of what it felt like when you experienced it the last time, that is why drug addicts are hooked. The recollection of memory of flow pulls you forward as opposed to pushing you. You're getting hooked on flow and good habits is priceless. Interesting. Hi, Rich. Do you use the practice of journaling like the Stoics? I do journal daily. I've been doing it for 30 years. Uh, Robin Kirk. Yes, let's talk. Okay. Uh, all right, let's go back to the note, shall we? Okay, so um, so as you guys know or should know, right, that like when I take my notes, I do something that I learned from Tiago Fort called progressive uh, summarization. First time I pass through something, I will bold it. The second time I will look at what I bolded and then I'll highlight certain parts. Now, what I used to do, right, with my book notes is I used to just take the document, like everything I highlighted, and then that would be what I would speed read. That's what would I would um, put into a binder, et cetera. Ever since I started using Evernote, I now put my book notes into Evernote and 
I'm not purposely going through all the old books I've read that I've now put in Evernote. I haven't even put them all in. I put them in over time, but I don't interact with them unless I need to. And then if I'm going to interact, then I start doing this progressive summarization. So this book, Finding Flow, is a book I read a long time ago. At some point, I brought it into Evernote uh, within the last two or three years. And at some point, I started going through this because there are already parts that are bolded. Okay, so let's see. Uh, the choice is simple. Between now and the inevitable end of our days, we can choose either to live or to die, right? Because wasted time is, are like mini suicides. That's one way of looking at it. Uh, but the actual quality of life, what we do and how we feel about it will be determined by our thoughts and our emotions, by the interpretations we give to chemical, biological, and social processes, right? So that all kind of falls under the umbrella of this, uh, not also, not, not a phrase, not anything I've come up with, but something I truly believe and remind myself of consistently, but have to remind myself consistently of is that life is an internal experience that we mistake as an external one. That everything that we do in life is for a feeling a way of like internally what we feel. We mistake the idea that life is an external experience, but it isn't. It's an internal experience that's just influenced by external, right? So, um, and the more practical question is how can each person create an excellent life? And remember, this book, once again, is called Finding Flow. Um, the first step, okay, so how can, so I'm just going to do this as we're talking. I hope that doesn't bother anyone, but I'm going to try and advance these notes a little bit. So that's the question, right? How can each person create a um, excellent life and the actual quality of a life, what we do, it will be determined by thoughts and emotions. Yes. All right. You guys with me so far? Uh, let me know. The first step in answering such question involves getting a good grasp of the forces that shape what we can experience, right? Whether we like it or not, each of us is constrained by limits on what we can do and feel. To ignore these limits leads to denial and eventually to failure. To achieve excellence, we must first understand the reality of the everyday with all its demands and frustrations. Okay, each of us is constrained by limits, all right? That's uh, getting a good grasp on what we can experience to achieve excellence. Okay. The cycles of rest, production, consumption, interaction are as much a part of how we experience life as our senses, vision, hearing, and so forth. The limitations on attention, which determine the amount of psychic energy we have for experience in the world, provides inflexible script for us to live by. So while the main parameters of life are fixed, and no person can avoid resting, eating, interacting, and doing at least some work, humanity is divided into social categories that determine to a large extent the specific content of experience. To live means to experience through doing, feeling, and thinking. Experience takes place in time, so time is the ultimate scarce resource we have. Over the years, the content of experience will determine the quality of life. Therefore, one of the most essential decisions any of us can make is how one's time is allocated or invested. Makes sense, and I think that whole paragraph is pretty damn good. All right. Um, it is true that the maxim, time is money, was a favorite of the great apologist of capitalism, Benjamin Franklin, but the equation of the two terms is certainly much older and rooted in the common human experience rather than in our culture alone. In fact, it could be argued that it is money that gets its value from time rather than the other way around. Money is simply the most generally used counter for measuring the time invested in doing or making something. And we value money because to a certain extent, it liberates us from the constraints of life by making it possible to have free time to do in it what we want. So where does time go? Well, there's productive activities, working at work or studying, talking, eating, daydreaming, wallet work, maintenance activities, housework, right? Eight to 22%, eating three to 5%, grooming three to 6%, 
driving and transportation, six to nine percent. That's some study from Chickam McCallie. What we do during an average day can be divided into three major kinds of activities. The first and largest include what we must do in order to generate energy for survival and comfort. Nowadays, this is almost synonymous with making money since money has become the medium of exchange for most things. Okay, so three activities. You guys with me so far? Let me know uh, what you think. Uh, okay, so I, first one is making money. The first one is making money. You guys notice that, right? So, like, the reason I do this is that the next time I look at these notes, right, everything I felt was important. That's why everything in here was what I took out of the book, right? But I'm parsing through this so that each time what I have to look at is less, but I'm fine most important. Between a quarter to more than half of our psychic energy goes into such a productive activities, depending on the kind of job and whether one works full time. Although most full-time workers are on the job about 40 hours a week, which is 35% of the 112 waking hours of the week, the figure does not reflect reality exactly because the 40 hours per week spent on the job, workers actually work only 30. The remainder of time being spent in daydreaming, making lists, and other occupation irrelevant to work. Okay, so like of the 40 hours a week, the actual work's 30. Uh, cool. Productive activities create new energy, but we need to do a great deal of work just to preserve the body and its possessions. Therefore, about a fourth of the day is involved in some sort of maintenance activities. We keep the body in shape by eating, resting, grooming our possessions by cleaning, cooking, shopping, and doing all sorts of housework. Okay. About one fourth our day. These Okay. Time left over from productive and maintenance necessities is free time or leisure, which takes up about another fourth of our time. Uh, all right. So there we go. Wow. You guys have, everybody's got grounding devices. Unfortunately, this ideal is seldom realized in our society. Free time is occupied by three major sorts of activities. Uh, The first is media consumption. The second is conversation. And the third is a more active use of free time and therefore the closest. It involves hobbies, music, doing exercise, going to restaurants and movies. All right, let's check in with you guys because it's always weird for me to review my notes without checking in with you guys. I feel like I'm sitting here alone just looking at notes and talking out loud, which is a little strange. Um, all right, let's see where we're at here. Um, oh, and let me tell you something else, guys. I um, And to the 75 people that are watching live right now, so um, I've always taken these two supplements. I take glycine at night. I generally take three grams of glycine at night. And I take a uh, supplement during the day, um, N-acenylcysteine, right? NAC, N-A-C. Uh, there just was a research paper released. My doctor called me to tell me about it, that um, when... You combine um, NAC um, and glycine, and you the body makes glutathione. Uh, that's like the the one of the best antioxidants, I guess. And I am hold on, I gotta go like that to tell you what my doc told me. So uh, I did. The, the challenge was the challenge I had was is that when he sent me the research document, um, it was in uh, molecular weight as far as how much to take. And I had no idea how to translate that. So for me, I weigh 80 kilos, 196 pounds roughly. Um, I would need to take eight grams of glycine and 10 and a half grams of NAC per day. Uh, spread out into three doses throughout the day. But the research was insane. 
this research paper, um, if you do a search for uh, glycine NAC, I would imagine it would come up and it is, uh, I will, actually I can share it here. I can actually just open it so I can tell you what it is for anyone that's interested. Um, it is called glycine and N-acetylcysteine supplementation in older adults improves glutathione deficiency, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, insulin resistance, endothelial dysfunction, genotoxicity, muscle strength, and cognition. Insane. Insane. Anyway, um, so that is, I'm starting that protocol today because I had them on hand. Um, anyway, so let's see. Uh, I was in the Navy air crew SAR and I had a class there in a school that taught me to do just that ground where I put my feet on the ground and use it as a way to reduce vertigo while in a copy in a helicopter. Is that the same concept? I don't know. It could be. I don't know. Uh, I know nothing about uh, earthing, um, but I'm going to try it and I will let you guys know. Uh, by the way, I love the multivariant testing on the last SOW. We just got VWL. I can't wait to get started. That is awesome, Jason. I've gotten a bunch of, uh, divisions of Agora to use it. Um, multivariant testing, man, like you can really move the needle. Uh, thanks for the perfectionism quote. It's the straw that breaks the camel's back for me. So my perfectionism ends tonight. It's hard for me to continue with that charade after hearing the quote. Thank you. Well, my pleasure, Yvette. Uh, hey, Rich, did you say life is an internal experience? I said life is an internal experience mistaken for an external experience. Is that rather similar to the internal locus control that we are all responsible for our thoughts, habits, and actions as opposed to having an external locus of control and where the individual truly believes that life is not in their control and decided by circumstances that are random? It's a little bit different, Rajesh, because what I'm saying is, is that the only way we experience stuff is internally, yet we think it's the external things and we give the external things power to influence internally, but it is the influencing internally that means everything and the external is completely irrelevant except for the meaning that we give things and the meaning that we think others give things, which therefore then leads to us wanting what to have people think certain things about us, et cetera, right? Um, all right. Uh, I did that one. Uh, sure, especially for being you being an introvert, you can try this one, and I guarantee you it will give you a massive rush of adrenaline that you can channel into that flow. Go to a shopping mall or any place with hot women and just talk to an attractive woman that you don't know. The approach alone is perceived as risky from an evolutionary perspective. That's why most guys can't do it. And then what, Lewis? Then you recommend doing that and then jumping into work? Is that the, uh, I don't know if Kim would go for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, loud and clear, Rich, thanks. Uh, I have a grounding mat too and also one device for my bed. Wow, so I, I'm, I'm late to this party, I guess. Uh, Chick sent Mikali. I hate to see you struggle. Yeah, I used to be able to pronounce it right. Uh, Chick sent Mikali. Chick sent Mahali. Isn't it Mahai? Yeah. Uh, is that flowleadership.org, flow and leadership? Uh, interesting. I'll take a look at that later. What does a grounding mat actually accomplish in the body? Someone else would have to explain it. Um, bare feet on the ground is my grounding device. <laughs> what app is this? I'm using StreamYard, but I'm using StreamYard with Ecamm behind it. Um, so Ecamm is what I'm using to actually pull the feed from my Canon camera that I've had for like 12 or 13 years. Uh, that's the camera I'm using for this. And then StreamYard thinks that this Canon is a webcam because of Ecamm. Uh, why? Why lysine? Uh, I don't know who's talking. Oh, no, glycine, not lysine, glycine. What is NAC? N-acetylcysteine. Uh, Steve Lanning, it eliminates the charge you have in your body from electromagnetic fields. So are you in constant pursuit of excellence and how do you continually improve? Um, I'm constantly in pursuit of improvement, right? Not necessarily excellence, but it's looking at where I've been 
and understanding that as long as I'm improving, I'm getting to where I'm going. Uh, Troy, you're my hero. Thank you for sharing. It's 15 minute short doc, uh, earthing movie. Cool. I will have to check that out. Will it sell me on earthing rich? Is it, will it do that? If I watch it, you can get adrenaline by going skydiving. I've done skydiving and, uh, the adrenaline rush was slight. I, I was, we were talking about it today. I think I'd get more of an adrenaline rush from bungee jumping, which I've never done than skydiving, which I've done a few times. Uh, thanks, Lewis. Uh, basically, our body is a bunch of electrical impulses. Grounding into the planet will bring you back into rhythm of the Schumann response. Okay, I know the Schumann scale response. We use that with light and sound machines, binaural beats. Absolutely, life is only an internal experience, which is why what Einstein said about the importance of imagination is true. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Can be. Uh, Rich, on my iPhone, I see your notes blurry, but you are clear on my computer. I see the notes and you both clear. Odd. That is weird. I loved what you said. If there's no if there's no end in sight, why race? Yeah, that's my point, right? So, like, I try to make it so that there's a reason to finish the day. Like, something wonderful is going to happen. And the Neil Fiore wrote this book called The Now Habit. And The Now Habit was one of these books, right, the kind that I like the kind that are counterintuitive. You open the book thinking one thing, and by the time you're done, it's a totally other thing. And if you look at like the uh, Internet Business Manifesto or the Entrepreneurial Emergency, you'll see that I followed that kind of format in both of those, kind of like the now habit, um, getting things done, e-myth. They all are like the way you're thinking about the problem is part of the problem kind of thing. And so the now habit is about procrastination and the way that you're thinking about the problem is part of the problem. The way that works in the now habit is look, you're procrastinating right now because you have nothing to look forward to. So when you think about work, you just see this long, like slog ahead. What Neil suggested in the now habit is to use what he called the unschedule, which was to basically just schedule only fun things on your calendar and then race to fit in the work in between those times, right? So I noticed this when I had my hypnosis centers and I would deal with these clients that were morbidly obese. And what I kind of had this hypothesis, you could say, is that I felt as if um, a lot of the people that I was talking to that were morbidly obese did not have enough of a life to look forward to. Like they didn't have a great social life. They went to work and then they went home and they sat in front of their TV and ate. They didn't have very many things to look forward to. So food became a source of fulfillment. And I think that it can be the same with work. Like if, like if you have nothing to look forward to, um, work can just be kind of a grind. And so if just like, you know, you can race through a day on your last day before a vacation, you could race through a few hours before you go do a fun activity. And then you get back and do some work for a while. And then you have another fun activity. Interesting idea. Um, but what I would say is, is that my experience of most entrepreneurs is that not all, but most do not have enough fun. They don't make enough of a priority of having things to look forward to. And because of that, they end up procrastinating. They end up kind of being ineffective and inefficient, right? I wrote about this in the entrepreneurial emergency and where like one of the best ways to get an entrepreneur super productive is to dramatically reduce the number of hours they work because they are then forced to begin making different decisions. And those different decisions will be much more in line with a highly productive person. Yes, uh, Teresa Marshall just put that study up. And so let me pull that up. Um, the one that my doctor told me to read. Um, Uh, throwing hand grenades can be a blast. <laughs> can be. So you don't want to run for the sake of running. Smart. Yeah, there's no reason to rush unless there's something to look forward to, right? Hurry up and then wait. 
is not very appealing. In a medical study, you can see inflammation drop on the screen. It's kind of uh, sold me. Science, LOL. Uh, Teresa Marshall. That is the article. Here's the link for the NAC plus glycine study for anyone interested in checking into it further. You know, my doctor doesn't generally tell me, like, you got to check this out. So for him to reach out to me and say, you got to look at this. This is amazing and you need to do this. Um, you know, I'd like to think I... Like, this is one of the areas where I have, like, contact with some of the best in the world. And um, I, therefore, I'm passing along this information to you because, like I said, I think my doctor is one of the tops out there. And if he's calling me to tell me this, uh, I'm calling you and telling you this. Uh, yes, after that, you can go straight into work. And the difference is very noticeable. Well, in my case, I talked to the woman for a few minutes and get her cell phone number, but you can skip that part so your girlfriend doesn't get mad at you. Ha ha. Yeah, she doesn't have anything to worry about. I've got zero game. Uh, hi, Rich. You talk about being continuing improvement. Would that be an incremental 1% a day or exponential 100% per day or week? As if you do increase improvement by 1% a day, that would be 352% a year. Well, it'd actually be more than 352% because of compounds, right? But, you know, I read um, and I wrote like about it in uh, The Hidden Obstacles, right? Um, a book that influenced me greatly when I was younger. Um, well, not that much younger, actually. It's not that old of a book. Uh, the Slight Edge. Because, and I buy into that because like in life in general, there is no staying the same. You are either trending upwards or you're trending downwards in everything, right? You're either getting healthier or you're getting less healthy, you're, right? You're either getting richer or you're getting less rich, but you're not staying exactly the same, right? And so part of like high performance is recognizing that you're either, you're either trending up or trending down and you want to be trending up. And the way you do that is by focusing on those incremental small little things that will and can continue to push your performance. <laughs> uh, thank you, Rich. My pleasure. Earthing the movie. Cool. I'll have to check that out. All right. So let's go back to the notes, shall we? Okay. Uh, the three main functions, production, maintenance, and leisure, absorb our psychic energy. They provide the information that goes through the mind day after day from birth to the end of life. Thus, in essence, what our life is consists in experiences related to work, to keeping the things that we already have from falling apart, and to whatever else we do in our free time. I'd say that's true. That's what our life consists of. Um everyday life is defined not only by what we do, but also by who we are with. Our actions and feelings are always influenced by other people, whether they are present or not. Ever since Aristotle, it has been known that humans were social animals, both physically and psychologically. We depend on the company of others. Right. Which is why, like when the, why solitary confinement is so, such a horrible thing. Oh, whoops. I forgot to take the, uh, notes there. Okay. Most people spend roughly equal amounts of time in three social contexts. The first is made up of strangers, coworkers, or for young people, fellow students. This public space is where one actions are evaluated by others, where one competes for resources and where one might establish collaborative relationships with others. It has been argued that this public sphere of action is the most important for developing one's potential. The one where the highest risks are run by the greatest growth occurs. All right. There we go. And as I'm doing this, I wonder, uh, like, as you look at what I highlight, do you disagree or agree with what I'm doing? Like, you might think I'm over highlighting, which wouldn't be too strange. The second context is made up of one's family. So you can see that that really <laughs> didn't send me to lots of notes. Then there was the context defined by the absence of other people, solitude. In technological societies, we spend about one third of the day alone, a much greater proportion than in tribal societies where being alone is considered dangerous. Yeah, I think we spend too much time in isolation, to be honest with you guys. 
Uh, but the one person, but one person might love work and the other hate it. One person might enjoy free time. The other be bored when there's nothing to do. So while what we do day in and day out has a lot to do with what kind of life we have, how we experience what we do is even more important. All right. Uh, all right. And let me just see what you guys are talking about here. If I'm missing anything. All right. No, no comments. So let's keep going. Emotions are in some respect, the most subjective elements of consciousness, since it's only the person himself or herself who can tell whether he or truly experiences love, shame, happiness, gratitude, etc. Thus, we often find ourselves in the paradoxical position of being like a behavioral psychologist when we look at other people, discounting what they say and trusting only what they do. Whereas when we look at ourselves, we're like phenomenologists taking our inner feelings more seriously than outside events uh, or overt actions. That's the, that's called the fundamental attribution error. That's a cognitive bias, actually. Um, happiness is the prototype of the positive emotions. As many a thinker since Aristotle has said, everything we do is ultimately aimed at experiencing happiness. We don't really want wealth or health or fame as such. We want these things because we hope that they will make us happy. But happiness we seek not because it will get us something else, but for its own sake. If happiness really is, if happiness re is really the bottom line of life, what do we know about it? Sartre, uh, the hold on. Sartre has told us that most people live with false consciousness, pretending even to themselves that they are living in the best of all possible worlds. More recently, Michael Foucault and the postmodernists have made it clear that what people tell us does not reflect real events, but only a style of narrative, a way of talking that refers to only that refers only to itself. Um, all right. A number of personal qualities are related to how happy people describe themselves. For instance, a healthy extrovert with strong self-esteem, a stable marriage, and religious faith will be more likely to say he is happy than a chronically ill, introverted, and divorced atheist, which is low. It is likely, for instance, that... I, why is it... What does this have to do with flow, though? I'm going to just scroll through. Oh, I stopped there in that. These were kind of disappointing. Let's pull up the uh, other notes on flow, and I apologize if... Uh, you know, I never know where this might take me. All right. So we got a little bit where we went over those four factors. Let's now go back to, I don't know what you guys are looking at. There we go. And now I guess I'm going to go, since my notes don't seem to link correctly, um, yeah, I don't think I've processed this one. Did I? No. Um, and did I? Yeah, these I'm going to have to go through. All right, let's see. And I went through that. Let's see. Learn more, study less, flow-based note-taking. Oh, that looks kind of cool. All right. Let's take a look at this. And while we're pulling up this for a second, I'm going to make that bigger. Um, let's now go back to me for a second. Hey, okay. Uh, the Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. Yes, I've listened to the audio and another book that I would highly recommend, The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. Yep, they're both good books. Perhaps another way of saying some of what you are conveying is to intentionally create contrast during the day. In this way, variety becomes a big part of a formula for staying engaged and interested. The conscious intention would be a way of, of creating a compelling future moments to live into. That's a good point, Tim. And, you know, Talman Knutson was on earlier today, uh, and he... Uh, created different programs for people with ADD, uh, him having it as well as myself, as well as many marketers. And um, one thing, like when he was working on it, I said, like, 
give me an example. And he said, well, you know how like you like to jump from project to project? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I know, know, know very well like that. And he said, well, one of the suggestions I make to my clients with ADD is to take a project and break it up into as many sub projects as you can so that you can advance, you can work on one project, but you can have the experience of jumping from thing to thing to thing, yet at the same time, still working on the same project, but different elements of it, right? So your desire to um, multitask or is now handled by multitasking and within a project as opposed to outside amongst projects. And I thought that was really smart. Uh, let me know what you guys think of that. But that was a Talman idea. Oh, wait. Rich, what is your juxtaposition of happiness with joy in your opinion? Well, happiness for me is engagement in life. I'm engaged in life when I'm in pursuit. So I feel most alive when I'm pursuing something or anything. And so recognizing that about myself, recognizing it has nothing to do with the attainment or the achievement of that pursuit, because that joy, that happiness, that feeling of accomplishment will be fleeting. That at the end of the day, what's most important to me is that I'm in pursuit. If I'm not in pursuit, I'm not happy. And if I'm in pursuit, I am happy and things fall in line. I don't know if that makes sense to you, Steve, but that's kind of the big kind of takeaway I got when I really looked at my life and looked at why I wasn't happy, even though I achieved all the goals that I had set for myself when I was younger, the reason why was that um, I was no longer in pursuit. Our notes today from any book, um, they're from all over the place, and I'm going to have to create some more solid notes for you guys, which we'll cover on Thursday. Uh, I miss Telman, and I'm late to the cast. Mega bummer. Yeah, Talman was on earlier, uh, just saying hi. I don't know if he's still here. But um, yeah, Talman's a good guy. I've known Talman for over 20 years. He actually owned a hypnosis center uh, a gazillion years ago. Um, all right, let's see. Um, let's see. Tony Robbins, how you have a good day is to do the things that you want to experience all day. Easy. <laughs> Uh, nice t-shirt. Yeah, we talked about the change of t-shirts, but it's only for today. Hi, Rich. Which is better for writing down and achieving goals? Setting smart or BHAGs? It really depends, right? It depends on the type of person you are. Certain people are going to be, they want to change the world. That's what drives them. So for them, having that big ambitious goal or audacious goal is going to be very motivating. Other people would back down from that. They only want to do things that they believe they can achieve. So I would say that that, especially Rajesh, is one of those things that uh, you got to kind of figure out for yourself. Are what you perceive as doable more motivating, or do you? Is it what you perceive as possible? and like but impactful that you find motivating i'm alive when i'm helping people i hear you good thing i'm a doctor yeah i guess so uh hi rich happiness is progressive realization of a worthy ideal goal quoted by earl or knight all founder of yes i've heard that quote before right it's the progressive realization it's not the full realization because when you have the full realization you're then happy for like a week or two and then it goes away that's what the hedonic treadmill is all about it's real no matter what level of success you think would boggle your mind today if you achieved it you would eventually get bored of it that's just that if you're like every other hum human who has ever lived 
Our simulations validate your point. Task switching cost is much lower than project switching costs. So it makes sense that if you need to multitask, switch tasks within the same project rather than switching tasks between projects. And for those who don't know who Mr. or Dr. Alan Bernard is, uh, he was the head of Gold Rat Research Labs, uh, the primary protege of... Um, Eli Goldratt, the creator of Theory of Constraints, kind of like Jay is my mentor. Eli was Alan's mentor. Uh, this is an aha moment. I tend to have such a hard time sticking with one thing at a time, especially when I experience a roadblock. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, hey, Russell. Nice to see you. Uh, Melissa Zolo, who is imagine who is imagist from new york doesn't even deal with the problem because all answers exist within and living in the imaginal present moment which is why our imagination is so crucial with our feelings past problems and repressed memories is where most people live but we should create from our own imagination she definitely someone you should talk to rich present memory all right um let's see if i get it take a pick of that and I'll search her out. I, there's a bunch of people that people want me to talk to, so I will get that. Oh, I remember Tommy Hudson. Uh, as a journalist, have you ever felt like you struggle to find your true passion? Like you don't really know what you really desire to be doing, even when at times it seems like you do, it eventually goes away. If so, what do you recommend for someone going through that? Okay, so let me just read that again, guys. Sorry. As a generalist, do you ever, have you ever felt like you struggled to find your true passion? Like you don't really know what you really desire to be doing, even when at times it seems like you do it, you do, it eventually goes away. If so, what do you recommend for someone going through that? <sighs> well, I think a lot of people have difficulty kind of identifying what they're passionate about. And that to me is a little strange, but like passion and purpose don't exist in a vacuum. They exist like in the world, in like in what you engage in. So I would say, right, that I have, I am a generalist. I have jumped from one thing to another thing to another thing. I'm certainly not the world's best copywriter. I'm certainly not the world's best anything right but the collection of things skill sets that i have make me a unique individual and it's the same for each and every one of us we are different and part of what makes us different are the things that we've experienced the passions that we have the skills that we've developed and so i would say david that um I always boil it back down to pursuit. And I do that because, you know, when I had my midlife crisis in my early 40s, I, th I had achieved everything that I thought I wanted to achieve by 40 before I was 40 when I thought about it in my 20s. And then I realized I wasn't happy and that created a problem because I now had all the things that I thought were going to make me happy that I had been working towards that I like it was the mountain on the hill and now I was on the mountain and I wasn't happy and that created this like turmoil for me and what it all boiled and so then I decided well like what's the point of having goals if when you achieve them you're not any happier so then I had no goals and that made the situation even worse what I finally realized is that the goal is not important. What's important is that I'm in pursuit of something. And it doesn't matter what I'm in pursuit of as long as it matters to me. So I always need to have something to pursue. And that for me is what brings me passion. That's what allows me to get passionate about the things I get passionate about. Steve E. Knight, love seeing you around again, Rich. Wait, Stevie, you are not. Stevie, are you newspaper girl from like about 15 years ago? Like the blog? I don't remember if that was you or not. And if I had, if I, if there weren't a bunch of people watching right now, I'd look it up. But there was 
back when I was writing the Attention Age Doctrine one or two, I spent a lot of time talking to this one female blogger, newspaper girl, and I think it might be you, Stevie, but maybe I'm totally off base. Um, look at the six human needs and figure out what satisfies three of them. That's the six human needs of Tony Robbins, right? Um, or more. Uh, this present moment is really at least many milliseconds in the past. Yeah. Uh, Rich. Yes, Manuel. Uh, passion. If you had all the money in the world that you'll ever need, what would you love to do even if you weren't being paid for it? Exactly what I'm doing now. I mean, and I don't have all the money in the world, so I don't want to give that implication. But um, I love what I do. Um, that doesn't mean that I love it every moment. There are times where I am not enjoying what I'm doing, but all in all, I really love what I do. And I, when I, you know, part of the reason I took so many years off was I was looking for something else to do. And at the end of the day, I came back to this industry because I love it so much. Um, let's see. Rich, are you sincerely and profoundly happy today? At this very moment, like right now, yes. Um, have I been happy all day today? Yeah, I did, actually. I woke up early. I had slept well last night. I went to bed early. I had a good team meeting this morning. I promised people I would get people certain things this morning. I was able to check those off. They, would, they had been bothering me. I then met the guy that might be my new assistant, and... That was exciting. I love meeting new people. And then I rolled into this. So yeah, I'd be today is a good day. And um, I'm happy. Uh, you need a pursuit. You need your needs are pursuit certainty of what you are working at variety as you keep changing the goals as you reach them growth and contribution because they make you happy. Okay. Yeah, I definitely am big on contribution. Rich, is the journey better than the destination? The destination is never as good as you believe it will be. The journey is the thing. That's it. Like, man, I know, like, it never feels that way when you're going after something. You really think, when I'm thin, I'll be happy. When I have a six pack, I'll be happy. When I have a million bucks, I'll be happy. You get all those things, and what you realize is, is that you're not any happier. Like, you now just take those things for granted. Uh, 15 years ago, but worked behind the scenes with Joel Com's Internet Millionaire event. Oh, cool. Okay, so you were not newspaper girl, um, but worked behind the scenes. Very cool. You know, um, I... When was that Joel Com event? Can you tell me, Stevie? Because if you can, I can share a note someone gave me on that set that I've kept uh, since that time. So if you can tell me when it was, um, I can tell. I can pull up that note because I can pull up my journal. Uh, where do you think the future of online marketing is headed? Um, well, e-commerce is the thing right now. Um, we're moving to a very interesting time. I think you're going to see a lot more uh, live stream selling. That's for sure. That's in the more immediate near term. I think um, this is like, I, this is a prediction that I think a lot of people might disagree with me on, but I think Apple is going to create their own ad network at some point. I don't think it's going to happen in this year or next, but I think it will happen. I think it's too much of a thing of an asset that they're sitting on. I know people think they care about privacy, but if they cared as much about privacy as we are led to believe, they would not be selling, to, they would not be allowing Google uh, to be the default search for Apple, but they're getting paid $12 billion a year for that. So um, there really is going to have, to, I predicted that, you know, last year in February that the Justice Department would go after Google and Facebook, and they are. I think that these companies need need to be broken up. And for those of you who are around my age, then you were around when they broke up Ma Bell. And before they broke up Ma Bell, there were no uh, cordless phones. There weren't cell phones. Like there was none of this, right? There were like 
all of the inventions and innovations that came around phones came after Ma Bell was broken up. And there really hasn't been that much innovation as it relates to online over the last like five to seven years as these companies like Google, YouTube, well, Google owns YouTube or Facebook with Instagram, et cetera. Like these companies have really kind of slowed down the pace of innovation as they buy out smaller companies that could compete with them, close them, et cetera. Right. So I really believe that something has to happen to Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, Apple less so, but um, I think these companies are too big and I think they're problematic. And, you know, like Facebook says that they care about um, the pixel and all that because of small business. Like what a crock of crap. Like when did Facebook ever care about small business? How many small businesses have lost an ad account or lost a fan page or lost whatever, and you couldn't even get anyone on the phone? So anyway, so I think that um, big tech is going to pay a price at some point, but they're them and Big Pharma, the two biggest lobbyist groups in Washington, and they certainly pay a lot of people off and our politicians take that money, both Democrats and Republicans, to look the other way. Hopefully that changes. There is no such thing as privacy online. Um, there just isn't. And anyone who knows like the backbone of technology could tell you that. So I would say that there's going to be a comeuppance, hopefully, uh, for big tech, if not the world around it might crash and burn, which hopefully is not what's going to happen. I would say that um, VR eventually will be here, right? That's going to be a game changer. But in the short term, live stream selling is going to gain in popularity. Um, and I'm not sure uh, what the fallout will be of the pixel, but I don't think there are many people that could tell you that yet either. Cool. I really appreciate your insights. These lives are so cool to be able to interact with you like this. Grateful for your time. My pleasure. Stevie Knight, 2007, I believe. All right. So I asked that because, um, yeah, I, um, let me see if I can open this up here. 2007. So Joel Com, who was a gentleman I coached years and years and years ago, um, I, um, did this big event, which was, uh, like who wants to be an internet millionaire or something like that was the name of it. And apparently that's where I met Stevie. And, um, when I was there, I flew in right to do this presentation and then be a judge. And, um, I let's see, uh, I'm just looking for let's see uh i'm looking for this folder and then i can because this meant a lot to me a uh, tremendous amount actually uh and i'm just personal and special docs no okay looking for this one folder so bear with me guys i promise it will be worth it um let's see i know how to do this um, all right. So while I'm doing this, let's see, uh, 2007, you said, all right. Yeah, it sounds about right. So let's see. And when was it in 2007? Uh, you don't know. Okay. So let's take a look. And And as I'm doing that, let me just, uh, I'll answer a question. Hey, Rich, I have another question. How do you deal with difficult clients? Do you become assertive or do you just feel drained talking to particular difficult clients? What are the most effective strategies for dealing with, with difficult clients? Well, the first thing I would say is like most people, most businesses or coaches or consultants never take the time to share the ground rules with their clients. And that means that you're expecting your clients to just be well behaved for no reason other than that would be nice, right? And that 
kind of makes no sense, right? So you can't blame your customers for being difficult if you haven't taken the time to articulate what is expected of them, how they're supposed to behave, et cetera. What I recognized early on, and this was kind of like a shock to me, was when I was coaching, let me take this off for a second. Um, when I was coaching a ridiculous number of people, right, close to 200 of them, uh, doing a half an hour every other week for each person, so spending about 50 hours a week in just back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back calls, I would look at what was on my, like each day, I would look at who was scheduled for that day. And if there was anyone that made my stomach turn, I would give them a refund and give them their money back. And what I found was, is that oftentimes just that conversation um, that I wanted to give them their money back, that I no longer wanted to coach them uh, was enough to create a massive turnaround. I recognize that I'm going a little bit long. I really just want to show you this and I'll answer a few more questions. Um, this, someone gave me a note at this, at that event. And that note, uh, to this day means quite a bit to me. So I'm looking for it. And as I do that, let me answer the next question. Oh, all right. Um, let's see. Amen, Rich. I really hope you're making a prediction which will come true. Um, all right. Okay. Uh, Dr. Buttar is pushing a block scheme that cannot be censored. But apart from that, it's a great way to get your customers. I think they are going to compete. Okay. Uh, isn't Apple way too powerful to be broken up by the U.S.? Um, Department of Justice as they grow to a 2.2 trillion company. Yeah, I agree. I believe I'm a libertarian, but these tech giants are just too big for sure. It was a web-based competition. We had some cool conversations about productivity and God. What a great time with great people. It was great to meet you as I, wait, did you give me that note, Stevie? Were you the one that drove me to the airport? I don't think so. But wait, I'll show you the note because it, it's got to be here. Uh, a note from John Carlton. Um, damn. Uh, let's see. Uh, notes from my daughters. <laughs> so what page am I on? I don't know. Um, I'm on page 69. All right, I'll show you what I'm looking at after I do this. Hold on. Uh, Steve, wow, that sounds like something I'd be interested in. Forget Rich, huh? Um, one of the best things in the world that professional service advisors can do is learn to resign problems, clients. Yeah, when you tell a client you don't want to work with them anymore, Talk about a change in the way people operate. You're right, and I agree with you on live streaming. I'm currently mentoring and coaching a young man who made close to 13K in the month of March. He did it all through live streaming. I haven't done the accounting on April, but I'm sure he did pretty good. What are some cool biohacks that have surprisingly worked well for you? Um, right now, Lion's Mane is something that I'm really, really digging. You can see my red light, juve light right there. Actually, it's... Um, this way, that, that's a juve light. Um, how do you feel about cryptocurrencies? I don't know enough and I don't want to, I went to the airport with you. Yes. Then you did give me that note, Stevie. And I've kept that note since you gave it to me and I'm looking for it cause it's in my journal and as long as I know the right date, I would find it. But I think you guys would be interested in this. Let me see if I can share. Uh, oh, I got to share. Okay, wait. Oh, I can just move this. Then. Okay, let's do this. I'm going to do this and then... Uh, all right. Move this here. Uh, you guys who are still on are very patient. I appreciate you. I imagine you dig this. Let's see. All right. So 
So there's probably a ton of bad stuff in here. I can't, I'm going to go through this fast. Um, but here. So here's my journal. Um, it's Key West. You can see, choose your, do, 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 do. look at how, wait, where was that? I just saw, do you see that? 238 right there. That's how much I weighed then. Uh, was I fat? Oh. So what we're looking at are my journal. And I'm sure there's lots of stuff in here. There's my daughter, Ava. Looking cute. There it is. There it is. So, um, you are a man of great influence. God has a plan for you. He wants you to know his hand is on your life. So Stevie, I think it was you that gave me that. And that affected me quite a bit and is something that I've never forgotten, even though you gave it to me on, um, let's see, you gave me that note. I just lost it. Um, you gave me that note, or at least I put it in my journal, on January 8th. Um, 2000, and yeah, I don't, I don't have the date here, but um, pretty cool. I can't believe that uh, it was uh, that you gave me that. Uh, Yes, that was for me. Well, I want you to know that whatever motivated you to give me that note uh, meant a lot to me. And it was random. And it was something that I have looked at from time to time. So, yeah, 14 years ago or something like that. Pretty crazy. Uh, so cool that you kept it. Uh, well done, Stevie, giving an, that note to Rich Sheffern all those years ago. Yeah, like 14 years ago. Crazy, right? Um, but I did keep it because I don't get notes like that very often. And it meant something to me, especially, uh, because it meant something to you, Stevie. So, uh, or at least it felt that way. And so, uh, guys, uh, I'm going to take all the notes that I showed you plus a whole bunch more. I'm going to consolidate those notes. I'm going to, uh, whittle it all down because I'm going to make two videos on Thursday about getting into flow. And so I am going to create some notes for you guys. And uh, the um, and then this way, I'll tell you where to get it on Thursday. And Manuel wants to know, why did that note mean so much to you? Why, it triggered something in you. Um, the... I used to keep a note by my monitor um, that, well, actually it wasn't on my monitor because on my monitor it said, teach what I know. Then I had a piece of paper of a different note that of something I wrote down once that Michael Masterson, AKA Mark Ford shared with me, which, which was like um, along the lines of me choosing a path that most people didn't go down that, I was using my marketing skill to make things that were not sexy, but necessary for my prospects and clients uh, to make appealing and make sexy. And that that was a choice that I was making to do that. And that I could use the same marketing skill to make a lot more, have a big, much bigger company if I wanted to go down that road. But that I was making the choice, right? And I wrote that down because that one, because anytime I wanted to complain about challenges or difficulties, I wanted to be reminded that I was the guy that made the decision to do this difficult thing of trying to make business sexy, of trying to sell what people really needed and make them want it through my marketing. So that was one of them, right? And when Stevie gave me that note, like I was also questioning, like, 
Like, is this, is what I'm doing, am I on the right path? Am I helping people? Like, you know, there are not, I'll, I'll end with this. And I th hopefully this is valuable to some of you. Um, the, there, you know, I've coached a lot of gurus, as many of you know, and almost every, I don't want to say every, because that seems like I might be exaggerating, but certainly most, most of the people I've coached who actually care have often found themselves in a position of making, of really kind of like, am I in the right industry? Because like, let's be honest, people, this like internet marketing, online marketing, biz op especially, but you know, that's lumped in is a sleazy business. And most people want to just take your money and uh, dole out advice that they're just regurgitating. And that's what, you know, the, that it, that's what the majority of the industry is, unfortunately. And so those who are the quote unquote good guys or good women um, often get reflective about like, am I lying to myself? Am I just one of those people? Um, who's just better at lying to themselves about what they're doing. Um, I don't feel that way anymore, but certainly I have, most people go through a process like that, and so did I. And when Stevie gave me that note, it's one of the reasons why it meant a lot to me. Uh, and it's one of the reasons I kept it. And it's one of the reasons I taped it in my journal. So thanks. So, um, wow. Like, I just never thought, I didn't even know it was you, Stevie. I didn't even, like, so thank you for that. And thank you for joining me today. And thank you to all of you who joined me today. Um, every Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesdays from two to four, Thursdays from six to eight. This Thursday, we're going to be talking about flow. We'll be talking about it more specifically. I'll give you specific suggestions on how to get into flow. Um, and uh, I will also be preparing some notes for you as well. So with all that said, guys, I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing me to do what it is I do and to have an audience so that I can share stuff with you so that I can help reaffirm to myself that I do this all for the right reasons. So uh, that's it. We'll wrap up now. I know I have a call and I'm three minutes late for already. So I wish everyone well to higher profits and beyond. I'll see you on Thursday. Adios.